Rod, I sincerely apologize for the technical difficulties, but this is for real this time. Welcome to the Single Track Podcast. It is such a pleasure to have you. Thank you for having me, Finn. No problem. Looking forward to chatting again. <laughs> <laughs> so a couple of things. First off, huge, huge congrats on punching your ticket to Western States this past weekend at the Canyons 100K. Um, I'm guessing you're feeling great, but are there any other emotions, thoughts, and feelings, stuff like that? Yeah, it's just uh, still in a little bit of disbelief. Um, honestly, can't believe that Western States is in two months and we have to run it back, but i uh, <laughs> really looking forward to it. Um, other than that, like my recovery has been actually way better than most races. I think races with a lot of vert, I tend to come back a little bit quicker, just all the up and down, you're using a ton of different muscle groups. So I'm not like really sore in one area. Um, I do have a lot of poison oak from the course though, and it's been killing me. <laughs> I don't know about you. So I also raced this past weekend, did not have nearly as stellar a finish that you did, but we do share the same poison oak, uh, after effects. I, I was rushing to the, uh, pharmacy earlier today to pick up some calamine lotion and, uh, we'll be applying that vigorously, uh, for the next couple of days. But yeah, dude, you mentioned so that, uh, it's so bad, but you were, uh, you were mentioning that, um, recovery for this race might be promising and that you'll be ready to go come the end of June at Western States. And that's interesting to me because this is this race, uh, in the golden ticket circuit, it presents a lot of challenges. You're only what, eight or nine weeks away from the big dance people that got in via Bandera, um, you know, UTMB, Javelina, Black Canyon, they had a lot more time to, you know, recover from their golden ticket efforts and to strategize and train for the race. Um, I know that you had an attempt at Bandera earlier this year. Was that the original goal to like really uh, nail this in early on and then have like a big, long training block to get ready for the race? It was, yeah. Um, went to Bandera for that early, early race. Uh, I wouldn't say necessarily just because it's super far out from states. Uh, it's more just because of the brutality of the the mammoth winter and trying to train through that up here would have been a lot easier on my, um, at least like mental state to be able to get it done that quick and then have like a chill winter. But um, I got fourth there and, you know, had a lot of, a lot of second guessing. I don't know. Should I do it? Going to go into canyons, but ultimately was talked into doing it and <laughs> very glad. Um, I think all the training will carry over. So taking a week off here won't really do much. So I'm, I'm not too worried in terms of uh, being fit for, for Western States. And, you know, at least now I have beta on the course too. And um, yeah, I always get to, Oh, it's nice to be able to, to run the course when you can. Cool. Well, I definitely want to get into a lot of the X's and O's of canyons this past weekend and also to look forward to Western States uh, in a couple months here. But you have a pretty interesting background and I want to cover a bit of it before we get there. The first being, when I look at your ultra sign up, it looks like you got into the sport at a pretty young age. You were 19 years old when you ran your first ultra the immediate comparison that comes to mind is Jared Hazen, who is also one of the best runners in our sport. I'm curious uh, what you were thinking at that time. Like, What was your inspiration to get into the sport? Yeah, um, I didn't know much about ultra running. I wouldn't say I really had any colleagues or mentors or friends or anyone doing it, but um, I was on a pretty big running kick around that time of year. I did the Boston Marathon uh, April 2015. Um, and I really just started to love running long, like those 20 milers started feeling amazing. <laughs> I kind of just love that feeling. And I didn't really know what was next. Um, I really thought marathons were the pinnacle of long distance running. Um, but my parents kind of decided to do this car camping road trip that summer. Um, they were going to go to the Grand Canyon, Mount Whitney, Yosemite, and I decided to tag along and pick out runs to do around those areas. So I ended up running rim to rim, um, Mount Whitney, Half Dome, a lot of the the classics in those areas. And I just loved hammering it out on the trails. Um, and I, I was pretty hooked on trail running at that point. So 
I also had this internship in the Bay Area, Bay Area that summer. So I was staying with my parents um, in the East Bay. Internship was at UCSF. So I was basically stuck in the Bay Area all summer. And I was training on these trails by home in the Oakland area. Um, I saw that there was a 50K being advertised. So I decided to sign up, not really knowing what uh, it was going to be like or you know who comes to these races and how to race them. Uh, it was the Skyline 50K, and I went out and did that race in a pair of uh, <laughs> road racing shoes and just brought no fuel, no water, anything, and just tried to run as fast as I could, um, and it went really well, actually, and <laughs> from then on, I, I kind of took a break from ultra running, but that was that was kind of my, my first taste into it. Yeah, I was just going to say, it looks like you also earlier in your career blended in competitive triathlon, which is really cool. And uh, I'm curious, did you have inspirations there? Was that just something you happened upon after getting into ultras and maybe wanting to uh, do like longer consecutive days, for example, in a more sustainable fashion? Yeah, um, I had some friends doing tri at the time at, at their respective colleges they were also back home in the Bay and they kind of talked me into doing it. They said I'd be pretty good. Um, I also got a road bike that summer and I was doing commutes to San Francisco for my internship. And I just really fell in love with cycling. Um, and just like how hard you could go on a bike, basically how, how you could do like 50 mile days back to back to back. Um, and yeah, I, I was just an endurance junkie more than anything. So, uh, cycling running i decided to to gut out the swim and, and sign up for my first try just three weeks after that 50k that summer so um i did pretty damn poorly but it i had a blast and i knew that the ucsb try team was a lot of fun um great way to meet new people who are like-minded uh endurance focused so i ended up joining the try team that fall um yeah following the race when you look back on those years in competitive triathlon, are there any unique influences you bring from that era to your current ultra running, whether it's from a training standpoint, cultural standpoint, just the way you think about endurance, anything like that? Yeah. Um, I think triathlon in general is a much more calculated sport than ultra running, um, or at least kind of the culture behind it. I, I know some people, are very calculated when it comes to ultra running. And I think it's moving in that direction, becoming a little bit more professionalized in that sense. But, um, you know, when you think of ultra running, you think of the spirit of like someone just going out and running with, you know, not much on them. And that's kind of the allure. But um, from my try background, you know, I was always really pushed to take in a certain amount of calories per hour. Um, I ended up doing Ironman triathlons. Like that's kind of where I found my place in the sport um i ended up doing the 70.3 that actually made me eligible to become a professional triathlete but i ended up not pursuing that and that was kind of my last triathlon but i feel like at that point i really dialed in like the nutrition and fueling aspect of things um and i was able to bring that to my first ultra or my first really long distance ultra it was 100k um the summer after and i was just used to to running and uh, biking at that kind of high heart rate, just above lactate, th just below lactate threshold for like 10 hours or so. So, um, you know, that feeling wasn't foreign to me and it allowed for a lot of early success. Um, fueling, I was, I was pretty on top of it. I know like so many runners who, um, you know, can, can't eat during a, a run or anything like that, but kind of had that iron stomach from the start. Um, but yeah, I, th I think like the biggest thing for me in my whole um, tri background was just like how much I, I loved like long days and being able to train super long. Like so many of my best memories were just going on really long bike rides with some of my buddies. Um, we used to do these 200 mile loops in the Sierra and <laughs> one of my friends, Austin, who uh, always is down for it and venture with me. He lives in Mammoth up here too, but so much would go wrong on these rides and there would be so much problem solving required like in the moment. And uh, I, I feel like that really prepared me also for things to go poorly in races and these long runs. 
Um, so, so yeah, a lot of these things that would normally phase, I think anyone jumping up distance to an ultra, it, it was definitely more, more comfortable for me. Um, I wouldn't say we, we completely learned a ton in the, in those moments, but it was good to have the exposure. So you're not fully shocked. Um, and yeah, it just honestly, great time. Well, you said a lot of super interesting stuff there, and it makes me think we should probably just do an entire episode on the parallels between uh, the tri scene and the ultra scene. But one thing in particular you said that was absolutely fascinating to me is that you think ultra running, our sport, is becoming more calculated in the same way that uh, triathlons already are. And for those of us, myself included, that might not know what that means, what does it mean when you say that ultras are becoming more calculated? Is that, is that where this sport is trending? And yeah, what does it look like? Uh, I definitely think so. I think, you know, we keep seeing these times and uh, records just constantly being broken down. And, you know, there, there's only so much of, you know, just pure fitness going into that. A lot of that is, you know, the the right scientific formula to keep going, basically. Like, are you taking in the right amount of carbs per hour? Are you having the right amount of electrolytes, sodium? um potassium everything to keep the muscles mm. functioning and like the metabolic processes are actually going so i you know and it's funny like the races that we start to see more and more of that um like hoka for example are putting on like the carbon x races and these like record races we're trying to go after like there there's only so much um that you could just purely do just on your own in those efforts. Like there's, there's so much more science that goes behind it. And um, now with like carbon shoes and stuff like that, it, that's kind of like the direction it's trending similar to the way that yeah. the marathon was trending too. And then I guess maybe in your own example, like with canyons this past weekend, are you like counting every single calorie that you're going to take at each aid station and where you can meet your crew, for example, are you, like really diligently planning every single step with them and interaction just to like shave off seconds, for example, that you spend. Yeah. That <laughs> it's funny. Like my, my progression from that, I, I used to not care about that really at all and just go for eight stations and stuff. But uh, looking at the data, I would, I would spend in a hundred K race normally, probably at least 30 minutes at eight stations, maybe even 40 minutes in my first ones. Um, and I think it, a lot of it was just like, getting to an aid station, not knowing what I want, just knowing that I need calories, but you know, what, what exactly is going to be the best for me in this moment versus now like planning it out. Um, I have my wonderful girlfriend who's my crew chief at my races. Now she comes to every aid station that you could be at. Um, we have a plan. We, I, I let her know exactly what I need at each of these aid stations. She has them ready. Um, ready to put in my belt for me, ready to, to feed me if, you know, I need to have it in the moment. Um, has a bottle ready for me to chug down anything as well. But everything is becoming way more calculated. And I think at, at Canyons, I spent 10 minutes total at aid stations. At Bandera, I think I spent 15, which I was pretty happy about. But like looking at other people, wow. I, I mean, I wouldn't say I would have caught um, Joe by going faster at eight stations, but it definitely would have been closer. Similarly here, like I, I got a golden ticket by 30 seconds. So like if I was, you know, taking my aids way slower and going from the stations instead of using uh, my crew and Nikki, then, you know, I, I would not be at Western Stasis yeah. in two months, which is pretty crazy to think about. It, this is one of the most interesting aspects of the sport right now, J just my opinion, but I'm really excited to see just how technical like interactions with crews become and just like the, the logistical part of the sport and how athletes have to be on top of that. Maybe the last question though I have on the triathlon front is, are you still somebody given your background in that area who believes in, for example, the benefits of being a multi-sport athlete and still being good at ultra running? Like, do you spend a lot of time on the bike still, for example, as part of your training, or do you believe that, you know, you need to specificity rules, everything and you need to be like singularly focused on your time on feet? Yeah, that's a super good question. I, you know, if you have the time, I can't see it hurting, but I think like the biggest thing for me is, is time constraint nowadays. So I don't really ride my bike that much. Um, 
I run about 90 to 100 miles a week on top of working full time. So yeah, that's, <laughs> that's pretty significant. Um, and, you know, it, it, there's not a lot of room to, to add things in either. So like my week typically consists of like two long runs, um, a pretty long workout and the rest just easy days. I don't really see where I could really fit cycling into that. I take Mondays off. Um, you know, I, that's mm. probably a pretty controversial thing. Like some people would maybe hop on a bike on a Monday and I could see that definitely helping. But I think with my background, volume isn't my problem. I've been doing volume since I was, you know, 19 years old. So I think like for me, it's more getting that specificity and training for the type of race I'm going to do. So, um, yeah, as, as like a volume supplement, I think cy- mm. cycling is amazing for aerobic engine. Same with swimming. Yeah, it's fascinating. I mean, just to close the book on this, I would always be curious or sorry, I should say, I'm always curious if like you max out as a runner, let's just say 15 or 20 hours a week time on feet could you safely add another 10 to 15 or 20 on the bike and basically be like a do athlete, for example, get away with it, not get injured and maybe even have a competitive advantage over other high level athletes in sport. It's just to me, yeah, it's I interesting agree. To think um, I really wonder, I think Hayden Hawks cycles a bit, at least from what I can tell. Um, another thing, like I kind of noticed it really closes up my hips. So like just sitting on a bike for that long, it, and that's like a lot of my problem issues for injuries and stuff like that. Mm. It's kind of my, my hip flexors. Um, so the more I can be standing most of the day and, and not in that kind of hunched over position, the better I feel, but I think everybody's different in that sense. I want to transition a bit to talk about, uh, the places you've trained over the years, starting first with Santa Barbara, you made a pretty interesting comment on Instagram a couple of years back when you said that if you can run fast in the Santa Barbara mountains, you can run fast anywhere. So are you saying that Santa Barbara is the best place to be a mountain ultra trail runner in the States? I would say it's up there. If you, and I think big, if, if you can afford to live there, um, it's an amazing place to train. The only thing it's lacking is altitude, but I don't think you, you necessarily need that unless you're going to race at altitude. Um, but the trails are just, they're so steep. They're so rugged. Um, they're they're really well maintained but not groomed so you know you you have to be on top of it descending and it'll undoubtedly get you better at at running in general um just because of that technicality you also have like the most amazing ocean views you could really imagine from any aspect of the mountain so um a lot of potential for long link ups there's usually running water places and it gets hot so if you're trying to heat train <laughs> amazing place Very cool. Well, I'm curious what prompt, because you're based in Mammoth Lakes now, and I'm curious what prompted the move there. Obviously, as a fan of the sport, I look and see people like Tim Tollefs in there, Cody Reed, uh, Danny Marino, like really, I mean, true crushers of the sport. So there's no question high level athletes train there, but you know, you painted a beautiful picture of Santa Barbara. So yeah, yeah, prompted the move. (laughs) Um, So I, after I graduated UCSB, I moved to San Francisco. Um, So a little blip there for, for work. Um, And I moved there gotcha. June of 2019. Um, I was there for a bit and I probably would still be there if it wasn't for COVID. Um, but COVID made work remote. I was really over just working from home in a cramped apartment in the middle of a busy city. Um, and it was like really unclear at the time also how long our company would stay remote. So I figured I'd take an opportunity to leave when I could. Um, so I kind of lasted about six months of working remote in San Francisco before I decided to make a move. And I had friends at the time um, moving to Mammoth and I was either going to move there. I guess this was October of 2020 um, in that group is Danny Moreno, actually. So I was either going to move in with her and um, one of my close friends or move back to Santa Barbara. And my my friend had a place there um, with an open room. So I actually ended up choosing Santa Barbara for about six months, um, mostly just because my uh fear of <laughs> the winter in mammoth so i <laughs> i was there for a bit immediately regretted my decision really wished i was up there in mammoth so i decided may of 2021 i would move up there um at the same time my girlfriend was living in san francisco nikki and she decided she was tired of the city as well so we ended up moving together up here 
Um, we got a lease for five months and we actually had plans of moving back to the Bay Area, but um, we actually ended up really loving it up here, found a great community. Uh, shout out to the Bro Nuts and all my friends up here. So um, really like we're here mostly because of them. It's We're having a great time and really loving mountain life. So. Cool. And so you have regular training partners and you have everything you need from like a specificity standpoint to, uh, to obviously perform well at the races you care about. Yeah. And you're um, I run with a few people in town. I, I guess like my whole kind of post collegiate, um, athletic career or whatever you want to call it. Uh, I, I never really had like really consistent training partners and I'm totally okay with that. Like I, I like the alone time training for sure, but I run with a few people in town here. Consistent ones are Danny Moreno um, and Bentley Regeer. I actually did most of my longer days this block with Bentley. He is an absolute pro in the Eastern Sierra. I think he's been up here for like four years. So he knows every single trail, knows what's melted out, what's not, you know. So great resource and and just really great dude. Um, He also ran canyons. And I think I was looking at the results. You guys finished like right next to each other, Finn. So, um, yeah, you should look at Bentley. <laughs> oh, awesome. Any other training partners up in Mammoth Lakes uh, before we transition? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I spend probably most of my runs with Danny Moreno here. here. Um, I consider her to be a sister to me. She's someone I could definitely talk to about anything about. Uh, someone who believes in me more than I believe in myself and just has like such a really good perspective on running and a really healthy way to approach it. Um, it's super humbling to surround people, surround yourself with people like her. Um, she's super professional in the sport, but has so many other things going on in her life too. Um, balance is really everything. You should always be trying to level up yourself in every aspect of your life, in my opinion, not just running. And Danny really reminds me that, um, embodies that. And she definitely forces me to be a better version of myself. Amen. Well, I have to second basically all those comments about Danny. We had her on the podcast earlier last year, and she's fantastic. Great ambassador for the sport. Great energy. And uh, yeah, that's pretty cool that you get to share a ton of miles with her up in up in Mammoth Lakes. Yeah, um, definitely. Do you want to transition here? Yeah, yeah. Do you want to transition here a bit to talk about race day, Ganey's 100K? And um, the first thing I'm curious about is how long you've been pursuing a golden ticket for? Because when I look at your ultra sign up, it looks like you've had near misses at both the 2019 black Canyon hundred K as well as the 2022 Bandera hundred K uh, before securing your ticket here this past weekend. So yeah, I'm just curious, how long has it been on your radar? How long has it been a focus for you? And um, what have you learned in this whole process? Yeah. uh, (laughs) It's been a while, really. I've been chasing this thing for, pretty close to four years. Um, I think the thought first got into my head in that summer of 2018 when I was kind of stop or transitioning off triathlon and starting to look more into running and stuff. Um, I think I watched some random emotional YouTube documentary on Western States <laughs> and I was pretty hooked on it. Um, I, like almost immediately <laughs> I went and signed up for a race near San Diego uh, it, they called it a Western States qualifier. And at the time, I didn't really realize what a golden ticket race was and the distinction between the two. <laughs> um, this race was the Cuyamaca 100K. Um, it was not a golden ticket. Uh, I I ended up winning the race. Um, didn't really get an award into Western States. I got into the lottery, but I am very, very grateful I ended up running that race. Gave me a lot of confidence. Um, I ended up running way faster than I thought I was capable of. And it really kind of began my all in mentality with ultra running and allowed me to really let myself get to the level that I I think I'm capable of. Um, yeah. Then after educating myself a little after (laughs) that race, I learned what a golden ticket race was and I signed up for the 2019 black Canyon hundred K. Uh, I went in with the goal of securing a ticket, but was pretty humbled. I think, God, who won that race? Matt Daniels won. Um, and then Chris Mako got second, but he already had a ticket, rolled it down to Sensman, um, who got third. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I got fifth just by not dropping out. I'm not really proud of that race at all. I raced like, or 
absolute amateur and an idiot and just barely managed to walk jogging in. But it was just one of those races where everyone was was dropping out. So truly just from grit, I was able to pull off what looked like a good performance. But um, yeah, that, that was it for that year. I didn't go pursue another golden ticket race. I restarted the hunt in 2022 or 2020, sorry. And I signed up for Canyons, um, but COVID canceled everything at that point. Gotcha. And I, I know you've said in the past that your race strategy has been to quote, not hold anything back. I think there's a couple famous people in sport that, that pursue that same strategy. Is that something you still believe in? And, and was that the way you executed the race on uh, this past weekend at Canyons or have you had like a change in philosophy as you've gained more experience in the sport? Yeah, uh, absolutely not. <laughs> I think when I said that quote, I probably thought I was way better at ultra running than I really was at the time. Um, but in reality, <laughs> the races I did were either just short enough that I could get away with that type of hard front running, or they just weren't competitive enough. And I could uh, buy myself enough time to keep the lead by gritting out a pretty slow finish despite fading super hard. But yeah, that's that's definitely not how I race anymore. I try to be way more calculated with it. Um, and more importantly, just race to my ability. Like I I'm confident now that I could run a certain time at a hundred K or a hundred miler, but the only way you could run those times is to execute it well and pace it. Well, you're not gonna, you're not gonna have a great race just by, by going out like it and, and racing super hard off the front. So, um, shoot for the moon and i i don't think you'll you'll end on any stars <laughs> running hard in ultra <laughs> <laughs> so does that mean for maybe we get into canyon's 100k here does that mean that uh just looking back at this past weekend um did the race not start for you until a certain aid station for example is it like you know in your head were you thinking oh you know the race doesn't start until forest taylor the race doesn't start in the michigan bluff like how are you uh applying that to this race yeah. Um, in my head, I didn't want the race to start until I got into the canyons. So um, my plan was to hit Michigan Bluff and, you know, just be in a good position. I wanted to be more in the race than I was at Bandera. Um, like, I think Bandera, I went through the 50K in maybe close to 20th place. And I was able to move up, but I I feel like I... I didn't give myself that opportunity to get a golden ticket because I, I might've chilled a little bit too hard that first 50 K. So I wanted to pace it a, a little bit harder at the start, just put yourself in a good spot. But I knew there were some guys I had no business of running with in that race, like Adam and David. Um, in my head, I was racing for fourth place. Like that's what I knew I had to get to get a golden ticket. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit more later, but <laughs> ironically, it's not, <laughs> I thought I was going to get my ticket from Adam, not David, but we could talk about that a little bit later. But anyway, so I, I had to keep a position to have a strong final third of the race while still holding back, make sure I had the legs to climb out of the canyons. Um, it it was definitely a tough line to ride at times and hard to stay confident when like the field is literally running way away from you, putting minutes on you. Um, but I've had my own fair share of blowups and I know that if I was feeling good, I could very easily climb that final climb 30 minutes or faster than some guys who went out with Adam or David. So it's a lot of just staying calm in well, my head. A couple things I have to ask you there, but first, so going back to your comment on David and, and Peterman, are you saying that either you didn't expect one of them to accept the golden tickets? So maybe Peterman wasn't going to take it. Yeah. I, it was at least in from people that I, talk to in media that I've heard from it was pretty like public knowledge that Adam wasn't going to take his ticket um I so I was <laughs> expecting to actually get a roll down from Adam but in the end it was David who who gave me his ticket so <laughs> we'll see we'll still see about now we all running states yeah <laughs> exactly yeah we anxiously await his decision uh hopefully this week I don't know it's interesting yeah. now that you can actually get I don't know what they're calling it for UTMB, but you can get that auto entry to UTMB now too. So we got to brand that somehow. Yeah. Golden ticket is interesting. Um, well, so maybe we compare and contrast the first half and second half of the races. So you're saying that it's hard to stay confident in that first half when 
the rest of the field is running away from you. But then again, you've had plenty of experience in the past knowing that there's consequences associated with that strategy. Um, so are you just trying to stay cool in that first half and just believe that things are going to fall back to you? And at the same time, you're going to have energy to um, make up ground in the second half? Yeah. Um, basically, exactly. Like I knew I was in good company, which was a little bit reassuring. I, was, I think I ran maybe um, mile 15 through 20 with Ryan Miller who I knew was also trying to have a really smart, strong race. So um, I was a little bit blown away when I got to Forest Hill and lead pack was 15 minutes up. Um, didn't think I gave up that much time. Like I, I, did, I definitely didn't feel like I was chilling super hard, but I was running within myself. Um, I did get a little bit carried away at the during the last climb up to Forest Hill. So um you're kind of like going through the Cal eight stations and everything. It flattens out a bit. And then you have, um, I don't know how many, how many thousand feet climb up to forest Hill, but definitely felt significant. And I was feeling pretty good. I saw Tim Frerichs at that point too. So I, you know, wanted to make a bit of a move and, um, I ran pretty hard to catch him and then wanted to, um, you know, at least show that I, I had, some stuff that um, he might have not been feeling in, in the moment. So I put in a, a pretty hard dig there and basically pretty immediately <laughs> I felt terrible. Like it was almost like I just bonked in, in the span of like three minutes making that move. And I like in my head, I was just like, Oh fuck. I just did exactly what I told myself not to do. Like, I feel like I could hardly run up these climbs. I'm feeling lactic. So it was a lot of like, I was mad at myself. And, and in that moment, like, I, I didn't really think I was coming back from it. Like it, it was a very weird experience from just feeling so good to feeling so bad climbing and knowing that you have all the climbs left basically for the entire day. So I really thought my race was over, but you know, it, it's kind of like in these moments, um, I guess my experience in ultra running more than anything has, has taught me that w how you're feeling in that moment is not what you're going to be feeling in 20 minutes or 10 minutes even. So um, trying to convince myself of that, despite feeling so lactic and feeling so bad, um, I was able to run through it. And then by the time I got to Deadwood, I was finally feeling good and it was a great place to feel good. <laughs> what do you do to, try, and this is maybe just advice that I'm looking for on my own. Like, what do you do to recover from those early, I'm not going to say mistakes, but just when you get greedy and maybe you, yeah, you just you just use excess energy there like what do you do in those intervening miles or those yeah those those middle miles there to regain uh strength to be in a position to again to close strong to pass people and to execute the rest of that strategy that you had kind of planned pre-race yeah um focus on what feels good i think y you know you can really get fixated on how bad you're feeling climbing, for example, um, and then convince yourself that everything else feels bad also. But I actually felt really good going downhill. Um, I was running a decent pace on the flat too. Granted, I, w I wasn't starting to race yet, but like I, I still felt fine running like eight minute miles on the flats and everything. And then on the descents, like I felt, I felt like I had my quads left, which is a great place you know, that's a great place to be when, when you feel like you could still run hard downhill, especially with a lot of descending left. So I capitalized on those things. Um, and I think this is where kind of that cycling background helps a bit too. Like a lot of cycling racing is making a hard move and then trying to recover from it. Um, you know, not letting yourself get defeated because you just spent yourself on that climb um, and just chill when you can. So I, I walked a bit of the climbs up from uh, Forest Hill to Michigan Bluff. And, you know, you're kind of like coming out of that last climb by that river where um, I think Tim Tolfson was standing, helping people through the river there. You got a nice climb up and then a big descent down. So kind of chilled that climb. And then when I got to it, I just decided to smash the descent to, to Michigan Bluff. I was feeling really good on it. Um, got to Michigan Bluff, got my aid, got exactly, you know, what I had calculated to get into my system at that moment, um, which included, you know, some salt pills, um, 
I took some Tylenol too and refueled on all my um, gels and liquids. And then again, kept that descent going down into the canyon. And then by the time I was up climbing Deadwood, I was like starting to climb super strong again. Everything kind of came back. And yeah, I guess, <laughs> I guess a lot of it could have been, could have been luck too, but um, I'm, I'm really, really glad how everything was spaced out and paced for the day. On a side note, focus on what feels good is a great race day mantra. I have to, I might have to borrow that in future races, but one thing I'm also curious about here is it sounds like you had an idea that if you got fourth place in this race, the ticket would fall to you. And I'm curious how much energy that gave you in the second half and how much that helped. Like if, if you, if you were, if you had been in the dark, not knowing if a ticket would have fallen to that place in the race, would you have been as motivated to uh, push as hard as you did, for example, in those last 10 miles? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, I want to say yes, because in my head, there were two people in the race that I knew would have a, like outstanding races. And those are the two people that won Adam and David, Jared, obviously amazing runner, like so much respect for Jared, but like, it could kind of go either way with Jared. And when I was like hearing what place I was in and stuff like that, I, I didn't know who, who was in third place. I didn't know. I didn't even know who was necessarily in first or second, but I just, you know, knew. Um, so I didn't know who was in third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth. I just knew I was in ninth place when I was in that second half of the race and like hearing it. So, um, I, yeah, that, that last climb, I, I was fighting for fourth in my head, but I think I would have fought equally as hard for third, um, especially with how good I felt. What mile of the race did you get into position there, into fourth position? And, uh, what goes through your head in that moment? And then I'm really curious to know what the psychology, uh, looks like trying to maintain that position for the rest of the race. Yeah. Um, I got into fourth at mile 58 out of 59 on my watch. Um, I know some people got 62 for the wow. race. So yeah, it was in the last mile. Um, it was <laughs> such a crazy feeling. And like uh, immediately in my head, I, as soon as I passed him, I, I, I knew that there was, there was no chance I was letting up here. Um, especially just cause we were, we were trudging through snow puddles, like, you know, the last kind of three miles of the race. Um, and I just felt so at home. Like <laughs> I I've been running through so much snow in the winter here in Mammoth and it just felt so good. So comfortable. Like I felt like, um, I was fine through those things and there, I, I wasn't looking back at any point. I just kind of knew that, that I had it locked in and I wasn't going to let anything let me, um, falter here so yeah uh, amazing feeling immediately when I did it I was like oh my god I'm running western states and then I kind of had this brief oh my god I'm running western states moment (laughs) um especially knowing I'm also running UTMB Mont Blanc at in August so it's gonna be a pretty brutal double um but (laughs) yeah I'm so excited for the summer well, I got to ask you actually about that. So with this new setup, you get, you don't just get the Western States ticket. You also get the UTMB ticket and, um, you're dead set on both. Like when, as soon as you got that, uh, you cross the finish line, you're like, I'm not just going to Western, I'm going to UTMB as well. And I'm curious, uh, are you a believer that the doubles possible? You can put in back to back high level performances at both those races. Yeah. Well, uh, I actually was signed up for UTMB through the no- normal process with points. So I signed up since January oh, for that race. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that was already locked in. Um, I wouldn't say I'm a believer in the double. <laughs> I mean, a lot of people and understandably have not uh, done it very successfully. Um, but I'm all about experience more than anything. And I, I don't know the next time I'm going to be able to run UTMB Mont Blanc, like with the stone process and everything. I, I'm sure I will at some point, but mm. I, You know, I I feel like I'm in a a really good headspace with the sport right now, and I love racing right now, and I'm going to capitalize on that because that is so much of 
this game it's like being ready to race and wanting to put your body like through through so much turmoil and endure so much and yeah i'm just there right now in my 26 year old (laughs) self so i'm yeah i'm really looking forward to doing both it's funny you say that i think it's spot on analysis i had um tim tolfson on the podcast about a month ago and he said that he thinks physically that double is totally possible. It really does come down to, you know, do you have the will to psychologically go to the well back to back? And if you do, sky's the limit. And that's, he thinks that that is either the, um, the limiting factor or the enabling factor for great performances there. So I thought that was really interesting and you kind of echoed it there. Yeah. Um, yeah. To close the book on canyons here, I'm curious, you know, we always learn things at, at races like these, I'm curious, do you have any big takeaways from the race where you're thinking like, I'm glad I had that experience and I'm bringing this new nugget into, you know, Western States and UTMB and beyond? Yeah, I'm only, I'm really only affirming my belief in, in pacing. Um, so many people don't do it in the sport. So it makes you think that's not the right way to, to race. Um, but I, you know, two back-to-back races where I've come from behind for, for big results it's the way to do it and it opens um a lot of potential for you to run an actual fast race instead of just like hang on for for a result so um i'm way more in on this theory also i'm way more um confident that i could turn things around when things start to feel bad um you know that's that's going to be a a very important in western because inevitably you know things are going to feel really bad and I just got to know that it's going to come around and just, just have the legs, have the legs for Rocky Chucky to the finish. This is the perfect place to talk about Western. You raced it last year in 2021. I believe you, you DNF'd, so it wasn't your day, but interestingly, you said that, uh, quote, failing at that race was the best thing for you at that time. And I'm curious what you meant there. And, um, on that same thread, yeah, what lessons you're taking from that experience into uh, this second attempt here in 2022? Yeah, um, yeah, failing at states last year really made me realize how bad I wanted it um, and how much I really do love the sport and the community and the level of competition the race brings. Um, very meaningful for me, but I didn't really understand that at the time, I'd say. Um I think I was in a relative low point with running before the race. I got in through or racing at least. Um, not so much running. I was still running a bit, but I was kind of in this weird place where I didn't know if I wanted to continue pursuing this, continue racing. You know, are there other things that are more important to me? But um, yeah, I, I got in through the lottery about three months before the race. Uh, I was, I think, 35th on the wait list for the 2020 edition. That one got canceled because of COVID. And then my spot on the wait list rolled over for 2021. And I think a lot of people dropped out of the start list um, after COVID uh, since they're allowed to defer to another year. And yeah, that kind of magically made me um, get on to the start list. And uh, by that point, I had no plans of really racing anything in 2021. So it was kind of a shock to me that I was about to go race. (laughs) the biggest race in the country. Um, I was putting all my efforts and training into uh, something like more personal for me. I was trying to go for this FKT attempt on the JMT over the summer. Um, And then when I got the email that I made into Western States, I really couldn't decide if I should do it because I was worried I'd trash myself after it and couldn't do the JMT. And I was kind of planning that thing for the last five months. So uh, yeah, it, it was a hard decision to make to go race. But I called some people, uh, including Chris Brown, who raced at Canyons this last weekend. Um, I really consider that guy a mentor slash role model for me for a number of reasons. I wouldn't say like we ever really trained together in Santa Barbara or stuff for that much, but just like a really good example of like who I'd like to be in the sport and, you know, the kind of attitude he brings to it. Um, and yeah, he, he quickly talked me into doing the race. Um, but despite all that, I, I feel like my heart wasn't like fully into it. And from the start, I didn't really feel like I belonged there. 
And um, when the going got tough for me in the canyons, it just kind of really validated and affirmed that narrative in my head. So there's a lot of negative self-talk, you know, the why am I doing this kind of thoughts. Um, and ultimately, I, I ended up cracking. So, yeah, that that was kind of my 2021 experience. But uh, I, I'm, you know, wouldn't really have wouldn't really want another experience because, you know, so much of that is just going to drive me getting to that finish line this next year. What are you, what are you applying to this year's race? Like what are some, uh, specific strategies, lessons, takeaways, tactics, all that, um, you know, we, you know, we're bringing this full circle back to, uh, the calculating side of our sport. I'm curious what, uh, yeah, how you're going to, how you're going to apply all this wisdom to 2022. Yeah, totally. Um, you know, my, my coach and I were actually just talking about this and what went wrong last year is, you know, it's not like this super complicated thing in, in simplest words, I, I really just went out too hard, even though I didn't feel like I went out too hard. Like I, I think I was in 20th place at Robinson flat, which in my head is like where I wanted to be. But um, we really dug into the data behind it, uh, pulled up files from my best races and worst, looked at the heart rate data. And um, basically, the problem with Western is that you don't feel like you're running hard, obviously, because it's it's mostly downhill to El Dorado Canyon. And that's the first 50 miles of the race. Um, you could run at a 160 heart rate and not feel like you're working because of that and say like your lactate threshold is 180, for example, like you're, you're getting pretty close to it, but you're running downhill and you're not breathing hard. Um, compound mm-hmm. that with the eccentric contraction of running down versus concentric of running up. And you're actually releasing a lot more lactate in your blood. Um, just because naturally you, you release more lactate in an eccentric contraction. So now your blood is getting super acidic not necessarily from that lactate, but from the free hydrogen ion release in the metabolic reaction. And your brain is just telling you to stop or like we'll blow up or whatever. And um, now it's like suddenly impossible to get your heart rate up and move your legs quick when you need to, when you're at Forest Hill, when you're running downhill for the rest of the race, you know, Mm. that's where you need to go. And your heart's just, your brain's not letting your heart pump and your legs move. So um, we compared this file where I was at 160 heart rate up to El Dorado Canyon with all my other best races like Bandera or Canyons even. Um, and in these races, my heart rate was way higher at the end than when I started, meaning that, you know, I was able to push and like kind of get to that level where I can actually close faster. Bandera especially, like the difference was amazing. Um, and States, you know, looking at it, my heart rate was down to like, the 130s when it was at the 160s earlier, despite like even all the climbing, despite even cardiac drift, like in these long endurance events when it should be rising over the course of it. So um, ultimately, I just like bombed because I I went out too hard. And yeah, that's, (laughs) that's basically the difference. I'm just going to go out slow. Um, 150 heart rate at most to Michigan buff. I don't care what anyone else around me does. Um, the problem with states, obviously, is that ego dictates everyone's first half of the race. Everyone, everyone there thinks they can win the race. When in reality, it's one guy on the line <laughs> who's going to win. You can't just go run with him because you want camera time. You need to run to your ability. And I know I could get top 10 at Western States based on my ability and what I can run at a 100-mile distance. Like Based on that time, I think I could get top 10, but I just have to execute it correctly and pace it at the right point. I can't just keep fading to that time. Dude, I got to give you a tip of the cap. I, uh, I've done a lot of podcasts and I think you're one of the most, I'm searching for the words like academic, analytical, like data-driven athlete I've come across when it comes to analyzing their performances and, and trying to uh, just find ways to improve. So I, I think you just gave the listeners a lot to to go by there when they're analyzing their own mistakes and, and looking for ways to improve you just call me a nerd all i'm all i'm saying is you used the phrase cardiac drift without batting an eye so yeah (laughs) (laughs) um dude this is this is this has been awesome and i really i can't thank you enough for your time i do want to finish up with a couple miscellaneous questions the first one i have for you is 
a new question that I ask a lot of high level ultra runners. And I mean this in a positive, I don't mean this in like an accusatory way, but why do you care so much about this sport? Given how much time you invest in it, how all encompassing it is, how it seeps into other areas of your day-to-day life, sleeping, eating, relationships, traveling, et cetera. Why do you devote so much time to this? Like, what's your why? Why do you care so much? This is such a hard question. <laughs> I I think superficially, it would look like competing at a high level, winning a race, getting a golden ticket, top 10 at Western States. Like, those seem like the why behind it and what I'm after. Um, but I think if I think a little bit more deep about it, my why is just like truly getting to that kind of new unknown for myself. Um, initially it was pretty unknown if I could run 30 miles, you know, it was unknown if I could run 50, a hundred while my unknowns have kind of evolved over time. I think the reason I want to get to that point hasn't, um, I just learned so much about myself when I face it going head to head, you know, I can either be afraid and crack or like I can execute and, that's super exciting to me. And each race, I can kind of bring the lessons I learned from the last unknown and quickly problem solve them when I face them again, and then go learn something new about myself that I could bring in the next. So the unknown for me recently, obviously, has been, uh, can I compete with the best in the sport? You know, I was really unsure about it going into canyons, um, even in the middle of the race when I was running side by side with some people that, you know, I've looked up to for so long. And really considered to be the absolute pinnacle of speed class and experience in ultra. Um, And I had tremendous self doubt in the moment and that was kind of the unknown, I guess I was looking for. And, um, you know, I was asking myself, am I running too hard? This is terrifying. I'm going to blow up. And that was just true uncharted territory for me. So I was able to overcome that. And now I can have that confidence that I can run with the best and bring that experience with me to Western and now we could face that new unknown of being at Rocky Chucky and <laughs> seeing if I have the legs to to pass people and, you know, sneak into a top 10 effort. Is there anything that you used to believe strongly earlier in your endurance sports career that you have since changed your mind about, given that you've been in the game quite a while? Yeah, um, definitely. I think I used to think that the person that trained the most is the strongest person out there. Um, Now I really feel that training and fitness are only about like 60 to 70% of the race. You know, obviously you need that base um, to be able (laughs) to run hard, but being tough, you know, mentally wanting it, being experienced and confident, feeling well and scientifically, you know, taking care of your body and all the little things on the day, that's what really sets you apart and allows you to have a perfect day. So You know, I definitely run way less miles than I used to, um, but I feel like I'm a thousand times more on top of everything else. And I owe a lot of that to my coach and just through failing at this thing a few times myself and understanding it's it's not just about pounding out miles. It's, um, you know, being on top of everything, really. Last question I have for you here. It's a question that we ask all guests. If you could put a message on a billboard for all to see, what would it say and why? Yeah, (laughs) this is a question that I'm going to answer and then I'm probably going to text you like tomorrow and be like, no, 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 here's my real answer. (laughs) This is a tough one. (laughs) Um, Branding is important for me, so it's got to be aesthetic. It's got to it's got to like have something to complement that message. Maybe like a picture of the Kool-Aid man and then you have the slogan, drink your own Kool-Aid. Yeah, I'll, exp- I'll like explain that. that. <laughs> we haven't heard that one yet. I, I, think, it's please, so, please, please <laughs> I think it's so important to believe in yourself. And it, it's really the only way you can ever summon the amount of hard work and dedication it'll take to get something done. And, you know, like whatever that is, it's running goals, starting your own company, you know, getting promoted, getting a PhD, going back to college and getting a degree. You know, we're we're all so capable and have the resources at our fingertips now to really learn anything, but you just like truly got to believe in yourself. And sometimes you kind of just need that reminder to to just do that and put in the work, but I am going (laughs) to, 
<laughs> want to change my answer because I, I think I feel like I'm going to get a lot of shit from this from my friends who listen to this podcast. So. <laughs> No, man, hey, hey, you know, if if they have a problem with self belief, they're lost, man. That that was that was good. I appreciate that. Um, okay, like I said, dude, I I've really enjoyed this conversation. You left me with a ton to think about. I know that the listeners are going to get a ton of value from this. I will make sure to link all of your socials in the show notes as well as your uh, coach's page. We're stoked to follow you at Western States. Is there anything else you want the listeners to think about before we sign off? Drink your own Kool-Aid. Yep. We got to reinforce the message. Dude. Awesome, man. Thanks for the time. Appreciate it. Uh, and we'll chat again. We, we haven't, dude, we didn't even cover like your FKT on the JMT and we probably could have gone down a few more rabbit holes with uh, triathlons. We'll, we'll have to have you on for round two at some point. Sounds good. Looking forward to it. Finn. Thanks for having me.